So today we'll be talking about protein metabolism. First, a couple of announcements before we get started. So Monday is, or sorry, Tuesday, February 11th at 5 o'clock p.m. in Pond Inlet is Brock's first International Day for Women and Girls in Science. Basically what this is, is a opportunity for uh, female faculty and female graduate students to show undergraduate students that there is a presence for female researchers at Brock University. Uh, if you're interested, I can provide you with more details. Just send me an email. Sex differences papers have been posted. If you're presenting on this topic, go check it out. We're back on track with office hours, so Mondays at 11.30 to 1 o'clock p.m. Case study number one is due Friday, February 7th, so this Friday. Please be on top of that. And a couple of quick housekeeping things to touch on. So first for the case study, remember it's a primary article, meaning that it's the original research where someone had a hypothesis, they tested the hypothesis, they found results, they drew up a conclusion, just like the papers that we're presenting on in class. This is not a review article. So a review article takes a number of primary articles and synthesizes them together. Next, an exercise mimetic. It is a drug or substance that mimics the effects of exercise, whether this is acutely or chronically. Next, your disease or condition must be related to the regulation of skeletal muscle metabolism. So some people have had some really good ideas but unfortunately, they weren't linked to muscle metabolism. Again, this is the focus of our course and it should be the focus of this assignment. If you guys have any questions, please reach out to me in the next day or two. Don't leave this until Thursday night because it's not fair to yourselves and it's not fair to me to try and make sure you guys hand in your best assignment at, by 8 p.m. the night before it's due. Next, thinking about succeeding in this course. If something doesn't make sense, please don't wait until it's too late. It's not appropriate to email me 8 p.m. the night before an assignment and ask for help. You should be talking to me about this well in advance. I upload everything so that there's lots of time for you guys to get after it and make sure that it's done. You guys know you can always reach out to me via email. You can find me in my office hours, or you can even make an appointment if those times don't work for you. I want you guys to do well. I want you guys to succeed in this course. So please come find me so that I can help you to do that if you are struggling. With that being said, start working on the assignments early. There's really no excuse for not completing an assignment on time. You guys are fourth years. You guys know kind of the ropes. You know how to get it done. And for most of you, this is your last semester of undergrad. So really, let's make sure that you guys get out of here. You guys work hard get it done, last couple of months of grinding it out, but make sure that it's done right. So to today's lecture, focusing on protein metabolism, we're gonna start off with an introduction to proteins, talk about how they're oxidized, then we'll talk about exercise and protein metabolism before moving into some influential factors that can influence how proteins are utilized in recovery We'll talk about resistance training, and we'll talk about conditions of muscle wasting. So just an introduction to proteins and amino acids. Proteins, in their simplest definition, are going to be molecules that are responsible for what happens in cells and organisms. Meaning that proteins are everywhere, though there are enzymes, there are receptors, they contractile elements, etc. You name it, it's probably a protein. Proteins are comprised of amino acids, so there's 20 different amino acids that exist. And actually, genes are responsible for telling our body what order to place those amino acids in to create specific polypeptide chains to create specific proteins. So when we think about protein structure, we're thinking back to first year biochemistry. We know that proteins are uh, comprised of one or more polypeptide chains. So a polypeptide chain is 20 or more amino acids. So it can be as small as 20 or as large as 4,000 amino acids. Again, proteins can be one or more of these polypeptide chains. If there's more than one, they're gonna be linked together. When we're thinking about protein structure, we're thinking about primary structure being a string of amino acids in their unique order. So individual amino acids linked together to create this polypeptide chain. 
we're thinking about secondary structure, we're thinking about the coiling or folding of that polypeptide chain, whether that's alpha helices or beta pleated sheets. Next, we can think about the tertiary structure, so the 3D shape of that protein. What we have here are hydrogen bonds or disulfide bridges that basically crumple this protein up into that 3D structure. Lastly, we talk about quaternary structure of a protein. This is the interaction between multiple polypeptide chains or different subunit arrangements. So for example, if we had insulin receptor in mind, it has two alpha and two beta subunits. The quaternary structure is taking those two alpha subunits, taking those two beta subunits, and actually putting them together to make a complete protein. So now that we've talked about protein structure, we need to talk about the amino acid structure that comprises these polypeptide chains that make our proteins. So we have four key groups, or four key components, for amino acid structure. The first is the carboxyl group, or COOH. This is a weak acid. Second is our amine, or amino group, NH2, a weak base. Please note the nitrogen in the amino group. What you'll see is that this nitrogen is going to be important for uh, oxidation and metabolism in skeletal muscle, and we'll re revisit that idea a little bit later. We also have a central hydrocarbon group. So this is just a carbon molecule that's holding together the other components of the amino acid structure. And we also have the R group or the side chain. This is what makes each individual amino acid unique. So that R group or that side chain is going to change depending on the specific amino acid that we're thinking about. So we actually have 20 amino acids or 20 different amino acids that can be either nonpolar, polar, or electrically charged. If they're electrically charged and you see the R side chain is highlighted in each of these, so whether it's blue for nonpolar, gray for polar, purple for acidic, and green for basic, if they're acidic amino acids, they have a negative charge. If they're basic amino acids, they have a positive charge. You'll see that some of these have a star on them. The 10 that have a star on them are considered essential amino acids, and we'll figure out what that means on the next slide. An essential amino acid cannot be synthesized by the liver. It must be obtained from the diet, whereas a non-essential amino acid is actually able to be made by the liver within the body. Animal sources of protein, whether that's uh, beef or chicken, for example, are considered complete proteins. This is because they contain all of the essential amino acids, whereas many plant-based proteins are missing one or more of these essential amino acids. So when vegetarians and uh, vegans, they choose to follow these diets, this is something they have to be aware of. They may have to exogenously supplement their diet with these other amino acids to ensure a complete amino acid profile within the body. Otherwise, they would not be able to form specific proteins, and this would lead to a lot of problems uh, for general health. So now I want to talk about the idea of dietary protein. So we get most of our amino acids from our diet, but how do we actually get them in the body? So we need to think about the idea of digesting those proteins into individual amino acids and how they can be absorbed into the blood. What we actually find in the blood and the extracellular fluid is something called the amino acid pool. This is a transient, constantly turning over pool. Note it is not a storage source. It is not, we're not able to store proteins or amino acids in the blood. We actually, just after a meal, can hold amino acids in the blood once they're absorbed from the intestinal tract. And this is where we can find a larger quantity over a short period of time. But again, they're not stored here for long-term durations. This amino acid pool is important, although it is very small relative to the mass of body protein. So for example, a 60 kilogram woman has 10, gram, or 10 kilograms of body protein, but only 170 grams of free amino acids. Just showing the disparity of total body protein versus these free amino acids in the blood and extracellular fluid.
Now we need to talk about this idea of how proteins are actually broken down once we consume a protein-rich meal. So we know amylase and lipase are enzymes that are in your saliva that are predominantly used for the breakdowns of carbohydrates and fats. But what we actually see is that once we swallow that protein-rich food, hydrochloric acid and proteases can actually break those proteins down into smaller amino acid chains. So they take those polypeptide chains, cut them up into smaller amino acid chains. The proteases do this by breaking peptide bonds. So peptide bonds sit between two amino acids and actually separate them so that we have smaller polypeptide chains. After that, so that occurs in the stomach. After that, we're actually going to the small intestines where those small polypeptide chains are now actually broken even smaller into individual amino acids. This occurs through the pancreas releasing enzymes like trypsin, chymotrypsin, and carboxypeptidase, which can actually cleave and cut those small polypeptide chains into individual amino acids. And we also have a bicarbonate buffer that can reduce the acidity of the digestive foods. So now that we have those individual amino acids, they are in these small intestines, how do we actually get them to the blood? So now we need to talk about protein absorption. So the microvilli are what actually increase the surface area of the small intestine. So that squiggly figure at the top, those are microvilli. And what we see is that they allow for amino acid absorption and those microvilli actually communicate, these intestinal cells communicate with the blood vessels in their close proximity. So once an amino acid is absorbed from the small intestines on those microvilli, they're actually brought right across into the bloodstream. There they can be actually delivered to other tissues like the liver, the kidneys, or skeletal muscle for tissue repair, muscle building, or even oxidation. But what we need to talk about is the idea of there's a number of different proteins out there. Are they all absorbed at the same rate? What we see is that not all proteins are absorbed equally from the small intestines, where whey has the highest absorption rate, so 8 to 10 grams per, kilo, or grams per hour, whereas something like milk protein has a smaller or a lower absorption rate at 3.5 grams per hour. What's important to note here is that absorption rate doesn't tell us about rate of appearance and rate of disappearance. So what we see here highlighted in red is that whey protein, 8 to 10 grams per hour, versus casein at 6.1 grams per hour, they both have fairly high or fairly quick absorption rates. But what we're going to see on the next slide is that the way that they appear in the blood is vastly different. So here we see whey is this idea of a fast digesting protein, whereas casein is considered a slow digesting protein. What I mean by this is that if we look at the rate of protein appearance in the blood or leucine appearance in the blood, what we see is that whey protein concentrations rise quickly, peak quickly, and drop back down to baseline levels following that protein supplement. Whereas casein, the protein concentrations rise to a lesser extent, and it's a prolonged, gradual phenomenon. So where does protein metabolism actually occur? So once they're absorbed, where are they taken? So protein metabolism predominantly occurs in the liver, and to a lesser extent, in the kidneys. So what we'll see in kind of attesting to this point is the idea that more than half of the amino acids absorbed from the intestines into the bloodstream following digestion of a protein meal, they're taken up by the liver. Again, this is a key point where protein metabolism occurs. Again, another thing to highlight the key role of the liver is that it's capable of synthesizing non-essential amino acids. So we can actually produce them in the liver, release them into the bloodstream for oxidation in other tissues. The kidneys can also synthesize some amino acids. So now we're going to talk about protein turnover and how it relates to breakdown and synthesis. We're going to define some terminology and turn our focus towards skeletal muscle as this is the focus for this course. So what is protein turnover? Remember that there is no protein storage pool. 
This is what, unlike triglycerides, which are the storage form of fatty acids, and glycogen, which is the storage form of glucose. So proteins, what they do is they have the fastest turnover rate and the lowest oxidation. So what we need to do and when we're considering this is that protein turnover is comprised of protein synthesis and protein breakdown, where protein synthesis is taking free amino acids, turning them into whole protein. Protein breakdown is taking proteins and breaking them down into their individual amino acids. Importantly, it's good to note that there is some oxidation of amino acids. So what we see here in this figure is that amino acids are actually turned towards metabolism, but again, the lowest rate compared to carbohydrates and fats. So if we zoom in on this and focus on one side of the equation, protein synthesis, we're thinking about grade 10 biology, we're thinking about transcription and translation. You guys don't need to know all of the nitty gritty steps in transcription and translation. Keep it super basic, thinking about transcription being taking a segment of DNA and copying it into mRNA. We then have translation, which takes mRNA and builds a protein. How this happens is we take individual amino acids, put them together into a polypeptide chain, fold up that polypeptide chain, link it with other polypeptide chains if necessary to make that complete protein. This is termed muscle protein synthesis or MPS. You might also see fractional synthetic rate or FSR in the literature. Protein breakdown, we're thinking about taking proteins, again, breaking them up into peptides, and then again, taking those peptides and breaking them down even further into their individual free amino acids. This is termed muscle protein breakdown, or MPB. You might also see fractional breakdown rate, or FBR. Taken together, we have something called protein balance, which is our ratio of protein synthesis to protein breakdown. Taking this ratio of protein balance, we can then start to think about anabolic or catabolic states. Where anabolic, we're thinking building up, synthesis exceeds breakdown. There's two ways we can achieve this. First, we can have increased synthesis, or two, we can have reduced breakdown. Both scenarios will result in a greater ratio of synthesis to breakdown or an anabolic state. For example, uh, hypertrophy following a resistance training protocol, like in that first picture, on the top there. We can also have a catabolic state, so favoring muscle protein breakdown or favoring the breakdown of skeletal muscle. We see that synthesis is less than breakdown or breakdown exceeds synthesis. This could be again due to two scenarios, one decreased muscle protein synthesis or two increased muscle protein breakdown. This example would be taking a state of normal lean muscle mass having increased breakdown and being in a state of muscle atrophy. So now I just want to talk about a couple scenarios of nutrition on protein metabolism. So fasting, how that influences protein metabolism is we can increase protein degradation. If we have a protein rich meal, we're going to stimulate protein synthesis because we have the availability of amino acids, but it's going to have a little, little effect on degradation. If we consume carbohydrates or fats, we're gonna have a spike in insulin. Insulin stimulates protein synthesis and reduces protein degradation. Importantly, we think about leucine, one of our branch chain amino acids. It's excellent at stimulating muscle protein synthesis and it's thought that it might work through stimulating insulin secretion. So if this amino acid can stimulate protein synthesis and decrease protein breakdown, we might have a greater ability to be in positive protein balance or promoting that increase in lean muscle mass. So now I want to turn towards this idea of skeletal muscle protein metabolism. How are proteins actually oxidized? So we've, up until this point, we've talked about digesting proteins, breaking them into individual amino acids, bringing them into the blood, but we now we know we need to get them from the blood to the skeletal muscle in order to oxidize them at this tissue. So what we see is that amino acids require a transporter to get across the skeletal muscle plasma membrane. This is because they have charged groups. 
There's kind of two categorizations of amino acid transporters. They can have broad specificity, meaning they're not picky about which amino acid they bring across that plasma membrane, or they can have narrow specificity in which they're specific to only one or two amino acids in that can cross the plasma membrane through that transporter. More commonly, we divide amino acid transporters into sodium-dependent and sodium-independent transporters. Sodium-dependent transporters, so the left side of this diagram and the middle side of this diagram, they move amino acids into the cell down a sodium concentration gradient. So sodium moves into the cell, amino acids follow. In both cases, sodium moves into the cell and amino acids follow. On the other side, we have sodium independent transporters. So on the right side of the figure, we see amino acids moving into and out of the cell um, without sodium being involved. So what is actually said about skeletal muscle is that it's a large repository of free and protein bound amino acids in the body. All this really means is that we have a lot of skeletal muscle mass. It's constantly in protein turnover, meaning that we're constantly synthesizing amino acids into muscle protein, taking muscle protein, breaking it down into amino acids. We're constantly flexing through synthesis and breakdown. Protein turnover is occurring to a large degree in skeletal muscle. This is really important in scenarios of stress, whether that's trauma, infection, starvation. Basically, we can rely on these muscle protein stores, and the fact that we can break them down into amino acids for fuel in times of trauma, infection, or starvation. So we can have muscle wasting in order to maintain survival, essentially. Again, I want to highlight this idea that because skeletal muscle is this large repository of proteins and amino acids, again, we're flexing through turnover and synthesis, we're not actually storing amino acids per se, like we can uh, glycogen as for glucose and triglycerides for free fatty acids. So what's actually happening with amino acids during exercise? Are they actually metabolized like carbs and fats? So we know carbs and fats dominate energy provision during exercise, but we also need to consider this idea that the metabolism of amino acids is also occurring at an increased rate during that exercise bout. Additionally, some of the amino acids can actually leave skeletal muscle to go to the liver. We know the bulk of amino acid metabolism occurs in the liver. And what we're going to actually talk about is this idea of we can remove the amino group from the amino acid to leave us with a carbon skeleton. This carbon skeleton is going to be important for the provision of TCA cycle intermediates as well as acetyl-CoA for the electron transport chain. Next thing I want to talk about and focus on is something called branch chain amino acids. Branch chain amino acids are extremely important for skeletal muscle in the sense that they're the main type of protein that we would oxidize in muscle. Specifically, one of the key amino acids we're going to focus on is leucine. But what I want to see here and what I want to say is that protein and amino acid metabolism only contributes 2-6% to of energy expenditure. It is negligible. And we're going to see that during exercise, the data is controversial on the actual fundamental role or the contribution of these branched chain amino acids to skeletal muscle metabolism. So what are branched chain amino acids? Leucine, isoleucine, and valine are the key branched chain amino acids. They're important, again, because they're predominantly metabolized in skeletal muscle, but they can also be metabolized in the liver. In order to break down these branched chain amino acids and oxidize them, they actually have to be broken down by three key enzymes that are involved in all of them. The first is branched chain amino acid aminotransferase, or BCAT. The second is branched chain keto acid dehydrogenase, and the third is acyl-CoA dehydrogenase. Remember BCAT because that will be involved in the next slide and we talk about branch chain amino acid um, during exercise and whether it's ergogenic. So what we'll find is after we've broken down these branch chain amino acids, we're going to have a carbon skeleton that remains. The carbon skeleton is going to be crucial 
for the provision of TCA cycle intermediates, as well as providing, in some cases, acetyl-CoA that can feed the electron transport chain and acetoacetate, which I believe can be turned to form succinate, which again is a TCA cycle intermediate. So now thinking about branch chain amino acids and whether they're ergogenic during exercise, we'll first consider some rodent data. So what we see here is that we have wild type or normal mice, that, and we have them compared to mice that are unable to oxidize branch chain amino acids. These are our BCAT knockout mice. So they're unable to break down those branch chain amino acids to provide fuel. What we see on the right hand side of this um, slide is that the knockout mice have a significantly impaired running time and running distance when we consider running to exhaustion compared to their wild type counterparts. So they reach exhaustion a lot earlier. If we look at those two figures, what we're really seeing is that branch chain amino acids might be important fuels for exercise. It seems that it's able to enhance endurance exercise performance if we're able to use those branch chain amino acids for fuel. If we look at panel D, what we see here is plasma branch chain amino acid concentrations in our resting and our wild, or sorry, in our black bars being our wild type and white bars being our knockout. What we see is that the branch chain amino acid levels remain high for those knockout out animals because they have branch chain amino acids, they're just unable to use them for fuel. Whereas our wild type in the black bars, they have lower levels of plasma branch chain amino acids, likely because they can take them up into muscle and oxidize them for fuel during exercise. But if we turn towards human data, what we see and what we consider is again, are branch chain amino acids ergogenic during exercise? So branch chain amino acid levels in panel A, they rise in the blood following supplementation. What I wanna highlight here is that we're only right now looking at the exercise portion of this figure. So between zero and 40 to 60 minutes, we'll consider the recovery side a little bit later. So what we see is that Yes, supplementation increases branch chain amino acid levels in the blood, but panels B, C, and D, we're looking at a variety of amino acids, whether it's glutamine, tyrosine, or phenylalanine. And during exercise, in the black and the white bars, whether it's placebo or a branch chain amino acid group, there is no significant difference between the two in terms of plasma and muscle levels of these specific amino acids. Levels of these specific amino acids in the blood is a measure of protein metabolism. So if more protein was oxidized or more amino acids were oxidized, we would see lower levels compared to the uh, control group that did not receive any branch chain amino acids. So what this suggests is that because there's no difference in the amino acid profiles in the blood or in the muscle during exercise, Branch chain amino acids have no effect on protein metabolism during exercise. But if you guys look at minutes 80 to the end of exercise, it looks like there's significant differences in the white, which is branch chain amino acids, compared to the filled black squares. Maybe suggesting there's an influence of branch chain amino acids in the recovery phase, but we'll kind of touch on that further down in this lecture. So now that we've talked about branch chain amino acids, they may be used for exercise. As good scientists, we need to now consider how we actually metabolically use protein as an energy source. Again, protein was only oxidized uh, as 2 to 6% of energy expenditure, meaning it has a small contribution. Nonetheless, two things need to occur for proteins to be able to form ATP in some way, shape, or form. First, proteins have to be broken down into individual amino acids. We then need to take the amino group or the amine group off of that amino acid to leave us with a carbon skeleton. This can occur through first transamination. So in transamination, we're actually taking amino acids and turning them into other amino acids uh, for purposes we'll discuss on the next slide. And then deamination, we're taking that amine group off of the amino acid, leaving us with a carbon skeleton. In the end, we want to be left with that carbon skeleton because it can then enter as a TCA cycle intermediate or as acetyl-CoA into the electron transport chain 
and a third alternative that we'll discuss in a couple slides. So transamination. What is transamination? Again, it's this conversion of one amino acid to another. This is extremely important because only a certain, certain amino acids can undergo the next step, which is deamination. This allows for the alteration in the balance of amino acids, so we can convert one form to another, increasing that specific amino acid and reducing another specific amino acid. This occurs with all amino acids except threonine and lysine. So what's actually the most common thing that happens is we take alpha ketoglutarate via an amino transferase enzyme, we form glutamate and something called an alpha keto acid. This alpha keto acid is super important because it is a carbon skeleton. And that carbon skeleton, again, is going to provide TCA cycle intermediates or acetyl-CoA for the electron transport chain. Next thing we need to talk about is deamination. So if we pull off that amine group on our amino acid, we're also going to be left with a carbon skeleton. And it's also the way that our body gets rid of um, amino groups that contain nitrogen, which are also toxic to the body. So this, what we do is we actually form urea. This is a process that occurs in the liver, specifically in the mitochondrial matrix of the liver. What we have here is that we have nitrogen from the amino groups that can be released as ammonia. Ammonia is this kind of temporary safe storage, but it's not good in the long term. So what we see is we take glutamate, turn it into alpha ketoglutarate, and you'll see on the back end of that reaction, ammonia is formed, that NH4+. But since I said that we need ammonia to be formed as a temporary storage, we need to think about bigger picture how we actually have long-term disposal of these nitrate groups or these amine groups that contain nitrogen, which is again, toxic to the human body. So what we actually have is the urea cycle. The urea cycle allows us to essentially long-term dispose of these amino groups or these amine groups. Long story short, what you guys need to know is that through a reaction that involves glutamate and pyruvate, we can produce alanine through an enzyme called alanine aminotransferase. If alanine is produced, this is essential because alanine can be taken from that skeletal muscle, sent out into the blood. Alanine as an amino acid can then get into the liver where urea can be formed and we can excrete this nitrogen, which is toxic to the body. Again, Big picture, the purpose is disposal of nitrogen at the level of the liver because it's toxic to the body. To note, there are two safe storage forms of ammonia. The first is an amino group of glutamate, and the second is a side chain amide nitrogen in glutamine. But in most cases, we would like to get rid of excess nitrogen because it is toxic to the body. So again, ammonia is a temporary storage so we need this urea cycle in order to permanently get rid of, of nitrogens or amine groups that contain those nitrogens. This urea cycle again occurs in the liver. And what's happened is once urea is formed, that urea is moved to the kidneys. And when urine is formed, we excrete it out through our urine. Urea is important because it contains two amino groups, so it's an efficient way to get rid of those nitrogen groups. But we have to be certain that our body needs to get rid of those nitrogen groups because it is somewhat energetically costly to have this process ongoing. So four ATP is required to remove one urea molecule. So coming back to this idea of our carbon skeleton, so first we had transamination, we got a carbon skeleton. We also had deamination, and we ended up with a carbon skeleton. So after those amino groups are removed, we have, again, this carbon skeleton that remains. And there's three fates of that carbon skeleton. One, it can be made up of glucogenic amino acids. So 18 of the 20 amino acids are glucogenic. This is meaning that it's a source of glucose. So glucogenic amino acids leave a carbon skeleton that can produce glucose. 
ketogenic amino acids, so leucine and lysine, leave a carbon skeleton that can produce acetoacetyl-CoA, eventually succinate, and acetyl-CoA, which is going to be our electron transport chain, uh, or which is going to feed eventually our electron transport chain. Alternatively, we can have these carbon skeletons make new fatty acids, which is going to be a potential source of acetyl-CoA, which can feed our TCA cycle. So what I want to highlight here is that, again, we have our carbon skeleton. Now we've talked about a number of different points that the carbon skeleton can actually enter the TCA cycle for energy provision, eventually through that electron transport chain. Remember that this is only 2 to 6% of energy expenditure. This is not a major contributor. And maybe that's why the data for branch chain amino acids during exercise is controversial because it is such a small contributor to energy provision that it may be difficult to pick up these differences. So now I want to switch gears. I want to focus less on the oxidation side of things and more on the resynthesis side of things. So thinking about exercise and uh, protein turnover following exercise, what we see is that post-exercise we have a stimulation of muscle protein synthesis and muscle protein breakdown. This increased turnover persists for 24 to 48 hours post-exercise. However though, it's important to know that although muscle protein synthesis and breakdown are both elevated, Breakdown is significantly greater than synthesis, meaning we're in a net muscle or a negative protein balance. So if you ate nothing for 24 to 48 hours following an exercise bout, you would lose skeletal muscle mass because you're in negative protein balance and you have greater muscle protein breakdown compared to synthesis. We're in a catabolic state. But importantly for anyone who does resistance exercise, we want to be, or is just a living person, we want to build muscles, so we want to be in positive protein balance. We can achieve this by eating or supplementing with amino acids, or specifically a protein supplement. To decrease muscle protein breakdown, put us in that positive muscle uh, balance and increase muscle synthesis. So panel A, what we're looking at is that White is synthesis and gray is breakdown. So at rest, breakdown exceeds synthesis. If we provide amino acids at rest, synthesis exceeds breakdown. Following RE, which is resistance exercise, breakdown slightly exceeds synthesis. And again, if we provide amino acid during resistance exercise, we have more synthesis than breakdown. Panel B is just looking at net protein balance. So kind of summing synthesis and breakdown. So because breakdown's higher at rest, we have negative protein balance. Because synthesis is higher when we give amino acids at rest, we have positive protein balance. Breakdown exceeds synthesis during resist following resistance exercise, negative protein balance. And consuming a protein supplement following resistance exercise, positive protein balance. Similar idea on this slide, just a different way to look at it in a different context. So on the left-hand side, we're looking at a normal resting state in response to meals in a postprandial state following that meal. In response to a meal, we know we have increased muscle protein synthesis. In that postprandial state, so following that meal, we've absorbed everything we can, we go into negative protein balance. So in turning towards that fasted state until we eat again, positive protein balance, postprandial state, negative protein balance. How does resistance exercise influence this picture? So if we look at the right-hand side now, perform, perform resistance exercise prior to the exact same meal eating pattern. So if you worked out in the morning and then went about your day, had breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you would see that in response to a meal, resistance exercise results in increased muscle protein synthesis and actually results in decreased muscle protein breakdown in that postprandial, postabsorptive state. Now I want to talk about exercise and protein uh, in terms of protein resynthesis in recovery. So what factors are we going to talk about? 
We're going to talk about timing, when you should take your protein, the type, what source provides the best results. We'll talk about the dose, how much you need to get those optimal results, and if co-ingestion of carbohydrates makes a difference in terms of muscle protein synthesis. So first we'll talk about timing. When should you take your protein? Not necessarily just post-exercise. We'll talk about pre-exercise and we'll talk about pre-sleep. So is there a window for protein resynthesis? Should you take your protein right after your workout um, in the change room before you even get back in the car to go home? Doesn't matter. So this subject or the study looked at eight subjects, four males, four females. They performed a resistance exercise bout. They measured muscle protein synthesis and muscle protein breakdown three hours, 24 hours, and 48 hours post-exercise. What they found was that exercise resulted in an increase in muscle net protein balance, so positive protein balance that persisted for 48 hours. So what we see here is that following exercise, muscle protein synthesis skyrockets and increases at three hours, still significantly elevated at 24 hours, and still very elevated at 48 hours. Muscle protein breakdown, it increases following exercise but to a significantly lesser extent. 24 hours, it's significantly lower. 48 hours, it's about the same as it was at 24 hours. So again, protein balance is gonna be the difference between synthesis and breakdown. And we see that there's positive protein balance for up to 48 hours following that exercise bout. So not necessarily a window, as long as you go home, eat a meal, go about your life, you will not be hindering your lean mass gains. You just need to make sure you have a meal in that 48 hours post-exercise. So now we talked about the idea earlier in the lecture about branched-chain amino acid supplementation prior to exercise and how it wasn't really beneficial during exercise, but we're gonna come back to it here and talk about how it may help during recovery. So what I wanna highlight here is that the top section is the placebo group and the bottom section is the branched chain amino acid group. What we're looking at in this red box is following exercise immediately, half an hour, one hour, and two hours post-exercise. If you look at most of the amino acids seen here, so aspartate, glutamate, glutamine, dot, 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 those are our amino acids. If you look at the concentration in the blood post-exercise, in the BCAA or the branched chain amino acid supplemented group, the amino acid levels are significantly lower compared to the placebo group. Because they're lower, we can make the assumption that these amino acids are being reincorporated into proteins in recovery, maybe enhancing our protein balance by stimulating muscle protein synthesis. What about pre-exercise protein ingestion? Can we prime the muscle with protein intake? So if we ingested protein prior to exercise, can we optimize resynthesis in recovery? What these subjects did was they ingested 20 grams of whey protein before or one hour after a resistance exercise bout involving 10 sets of exercise. And what they found in this figure on the right side is that whether they ingested it prior, so pre or post exercise, absolutely no difference in protein synthesis, which was measured four hours post exercise. So it doesn't really make a difference if you take your protein before or after. We talked about the idea in class that protein intake before exercise might cause gastrointestinal upset, um, which is not optimal for some athletes. So maybe just save it for after, but we're also not surprised that we can't prime the muscle with protein because remember there's no pool to store those amino acids. So it's not surprising that we can't uh, save them up in order to optimize resynthesis post-exercise. How about pre-sleep protein intake? So sleep represents this eight hour period where we aren't consuming nutrients. It's basically the longest post-absorptive period of the day, meaning it's the longest period we go without eating. Because of this, during sleep, muscle protein breakdown exceeds muscle protein synthesis. So what these researchers sought to question was whether pre-sleep protein intake actually can stimulate MPS to exceed breakdown. As discussed in class, because sleep is this eight hour duration, this long period of time, 
we would want to consume casein during this time frame because that's that slow releasing, slow digesting protein, which might be optimal for this long duration of not eating. So what these authors wanted to do was, in this uh, diagram on the bottom here, was they wanted to increase protein synthesis during sleep to put people in a positive protein balance to optimize lean mass gains. They took 44 young healthy men, put them through a 12 week resistance training program. One group was on a placebo and the other group took um, casein supplementation before sleep every single night. What you'll see in panel A is that both groups, whether it's placebo or protein, white is before training, black is after, they both had significant increases in uh, quad muscle cross-sectional area, so increases in protein synthesis, lean mass. But the important thing to look at is panel B, where we look at the delta or the change in quadricep muscle cross-sectional area, where the protein group had a significantly greater increase or change in protein synthesis as measured by the cross-sectional area of that quadricep compared to the placebo. However, in class, we discussed that maybe this wasn't a fair test because the other group didn't receive any protein supplement at all, not even throughout the day as you would normally take it. But again, this study was published in 2018. The literature, they addressed this limitation and discussed that in the future, they need to touch on the fact and seek to investigate how this actually compares to regular protein intake patterns or how this can augment people who ingest protein throughout the day on a regular basis. So now we need to consider the type of protein. So does the protein source actually matter, whether it's whey, casein, soy? Do we see differences in protein synthesis? First, I want to talk about whole protein versus essential amino acids. So what they actually did on the y-axis of the figure is they looked at phenylalanine uptake as an index of protein synthesis. So you could actually just cross that out and write muscle protein synthesis if you wanted. What they did was they compared a resting state to a balanced um, mix of amino acids, which is 18 grams of essential amino acids plus 22 grams of non-essential amino acids. And then they compared that to just simply 18 grams of essential amino acids. What they found was that, as you can see, that following the consumption of the proteins, protein synthesis or protein balance was positive in both cases. And there was absolutely no difference between the group that had non-essential amino acids and the group that just had the essential amino acids, meaning only essential amino acids are necessary to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. Importantly, leucine, as one of those essential amino acids, has been shown to play a big role in stimulating muscle protein synthesis. So now I want to consider whey versus casein versus soy. I don't want to talk too, too much about the study because someone is presenting on this in the next uh, week or so. But what we looked at here is we matched each group for total essential amino acid content, meaning we could compare the results that we got from whey versus casein versus soy. What they did was they provided these three protein sources at rest, as well as following a resistance exercise bout. What they found was that whey appears to be the better protein source, which is possibly linked to the fact that it has higher leucine content. So they found that whey stimulated muscle protein synthesis more post-exercise compared to soy and casein, where soy was even actually better than casein. So why is whey protein this um, premium or this optimal source of protein for muscle protein synthesis? There's two working hypotheses. The first is that whey protein can have this insulin stimulating effect so what happens is that whey protein is high in leucine. Leucine levels rise following whey supplementation. We see that in the left-hand figure with the squares that are open. Leucine levels spike following that whey supplementation to a greater extent than soy in the triangles and casein in the circles. But we do see a rise with soy as well, just to a lesser degree. And to mimic these rises in leucine, we actually see a similar spike in insulin levels, where whey protein stimulates a greater rise in insulin, 
And insulin is anabolic. It wants to build, it wants to synthesize proteins in order for positive protein balance. Again, soy also stimulates this to some extent, whereas casein does not seem to have this effect on insulin. Secondly, we could be thinking about the availability of amino acids. So whey protein results in these robust rises in plasma amino acids. We can see that on the figure on the right. And the lesser extent, we see soy has a similar effect, smaller degree, and casein, again, even smaller of an effect. Remember that whey is this fast-releasing protein, rapidly absorbed, rapidly digested, whereas casein is this slow, gradual-releasing protein. So soy appears to be somewhere in the middle. But again, it's still up for debate whether it is an insulin-leucine kind of connection or if it's the availability of amino acids for protein synthesis, which is driving this effect. So what about the dose? If we consider the dose of protein, so we're thinking about taking small amounts versus taking large multiple scoops of protein at once, does it make a difference? So if we consider taking one dose of protein, we look at six healthy men who consumed either five, uh, 0, 5, 10, 20, or 40 grams of protein in one sitting. What they found is that measuring muscle protein synthesis four hours post-exercise, that muscle protein synthesis was maximally stimulated with 20 grams of protein, meaning that from 0 to 5 to 10 to 20, there was increasing MPS or muscle protein synthesis with each increasing dose, but from 20 to 40 grams, no significant difference between those dosing protocols. Meaning, there's no benefit of dosing yourself with more than 20 grams of protein at once because you'll be just wasting money or throwing away protein powder when you could have the same effect with just 20 grams. So now thinking about distribution, so how many times a day, how big of a dose, does it make a, really di does it make a difference? Should we do it a certain way? This study, someone's going to present on as well, so I don't want to spend too much time stealing their thunder. But 24 male participants ingested 80 grams of protein over a day. This is whey protein. It was either ingested as a bolus, so 2 by 40 grams every 6 hours, as an intermediate dose, so 4 by 20 grams every 3 hours, or as a pulse, 8 by 10 grams every 1.5 hours. What they found was that protein synthesis was highest with the pulse delivery, which was 19% greater than the intermediate and 32% greater than the bolus. What I want you guys to consider is that we talked about whey protein being absorbed at 8 to 10 grams per hour. It's perhaps not surprising that the pulse group had the greatest protein synthesis, probably because they absorbed the most protein over the entire day. Because if we don't use the protein for synthesis, if we don't absorb it, we're just going to excrete it in the urine. This is a saturable process. We can only absorb so much and then only deliver so much to the muscle to be synthesized into protein. So what about carbohydrate co-ingestion? So can carbohydrates optimize protein synthesis? So what this study did was looked at six male runners. They each had either... They performed two trials, so one time they had chocolate milk that had 16 grams of protein. So chocolate milk is kind of touted as this um, ultimate recovery drink because it has 4 grams of carb to 1 gram of protein, meaning you're getting glycogen resynthesis as well as muscle protein synthesis. They compared this chocolate milk to an isocaloric, so match for calories, carbohydrate drink. Following 45 minutes of running at a moderate intensity, they consumed these drinks, one or the other, and then they measured muscle protein synthesis during three hour, uh, following three hours of recovery. What they found was that, perhaps unsurprisingly, chocolate milk, which has protein in it, improved muscle protein synthesis compared to a drink that's carbohydrate only without protein. As a class, we discussed the idea that to make this scientifically sound, they would have had to compare to a group that had just protein intake to look at muscle protein synthesis. So that's where the story kind of comes along, the study by Staples et al. What they did was they compared 25 grams of whey protein to 25 grams of whey protein plus 50 grams of carbohydrates. 
What they found was this idea that protein plus carbohydrates resulted in insulin spikes. Remember, carbohydrates cause insulin to go up. But this idea that insulin is anabolic, it should promote protein synthesis. What they found was that comparing protein to protein plus carbohydrates in this case, muscle protein synthesis was not further increased by the carbohydrate consumption, meaning the dose of protein appears to maximally stimulate muscle protein synthesis, and the carbohydrate in this case was unable to provide an added benefit. So now I want to talk about resistance training before we move into a few cases of muscle wasting diseases. So what happens to protein turnover following resistance training? This study looked at 12 individuals, 6 males, 6 females, 6 untrained or 6 were resistance trained. And what they found was that muscle protein synthesis, so that top figure, panel A, is unchanged with training. So following exercise, there's no difference in protein synthesis between trained and untrained, but compared to rest, we expect this increase in protein synthesis. What we find, though, is that resistance training influences muscle protein breakdown. So what we see is that protein breakdown is significantly reduced in trained individuals. Remember, protein balance is synthesis ratio to breakdown, so meaning we have reduced protein turnover in these individuals, in these trained individuals. So perhaps that means that resistance trained athletes should focus on the muscle protein synthesis side of the picture through supplementing with amino acids or protein supplement in order to maximize their protein turnover or to optimize and increase protein synthesis as a means to increase lean mass. Because we already know that the exercise training regimen has improved the protein breakdown side of the equation. So what about protein recommendations? So does every person have the same protein requirement? No, of course not. Uh, athletes, whether they're resistant or endurance exercise trained, have higher protein requirements than their sedentary counterparts or even that of children. Children have higher recommendations than sedentary adults because we need to optimize protein synthesis for growth to mature, for maturation, basically. One thing I want to highlight is that emerging research is now suggesting that these recommendations might not even be high enough. So I've seen upwards of 2.4, 2.6 grams per kg per day for endurance or resistance trained athletes. Now I want to end off the lecture just looking at some diseases of muscle wasting or situations where you would have muscle wasting. So um, more breakdown and less synthesis, so negative, net negative protein balance. First, I want to consider disuse atrophy. So disuse is low mechanical load or uh, mechanical unloading of a muscle. Common examples, so astronauts with a lack of gravity during spaceflight. So we don't realize it, but gravity throughout a daily basis puts load on our muscles as we walk, as we go about our daily lives. Furthermore, uh, injured athletes with braces or casts, anyone who has had a cast may have experienced when their cast comes off that they have smaller muscles in the one arm or the one leg compared to the other. And another common example is bed rest or physical inactivity. So this is commonly seen with older adults who may be hospitalized for periods of time that period of bed rest can actually result in severe losses of skeletal muscle mass. What we typically see is decreased cross-sectional area of muscle fibers, meaning reduced muscle volume and mass, reduced protein content, and a reduced ability to generate force. How this actually occurs is due to an initial decrease in protein synthesis and a prolonged long-term increase in protein breakdown. What I want to highlight from just this figure here this study did one week of bed rest in healthy adults. And what they found is that lean body mass, so muscle mass, they lost 1.4 kilograms in one week. And the cross-sectional area of the quadricep was reduced by 3%. These are dramatic reductions in uh, lean mass or skeletal muscle protein in a very short period of time in healthy individuals. Next, I want to talk about cancer cachexia. 
So what this is, is an equal loss of both adipose tissue as well as muscle mass. This is different than anorexia or starvation, where in these scenarios you typically only lose fat mass. So this is obviously um, dangerous in the sense that these dramatic losses in muscle mass are going to have negative implications for health as well as muscle performance. These typically occur in the advanced stages of cancer, most commonly pancreatic and gastric cancers, less common in breast leukemia or uh, lymphomas. But really what cancer cachexia is marked by is hi protein hypercatabolism, meaning dramatic and excessive breakdown or muscle protein breakdown. You used to have to know in this course all of the pathways of ubiquitination and autophagy, but really all I want you guys to know is that cancer cachexia and all of these muscle wasting diseases, how do they influence protein metabolism? So in this case, marked protein hypercatabolism, because we have the activation of a number of pathways that result in protein breakdown. Lastly, I want to talk about Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. This is an X-linked recessive disease, meaning it's more common in males because males have X and Y chromosomes. What it is, is a mutation in the dystrophin gene. Dystrophin is important for muscle fiber integrity. Excess calcium can actually get into the muscle cell membrane. This causes the mitochondria to erupt or burst. We have increased cellular stress or reactive oxygen species formation. This triggers muscle cell death. Have enough muscle cell death and we have premature death of an individual. So this figure on the right, what it's depicting is wild types on the upper, upper line. The lower line is Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. So they start at a lower body mass. And you can already see that it very quickly, they have declines in skeletal muscle mass, which is a decline in body weight, leading to premature death. So with that, Thursday we have ketone presentations. Monday is the last formal lecture for the midterm content. And the Thursday after that, we'll have the protein metabolism presentations.